absolute forefront of research in COVID-19 science and therapeutic development. Their efforts are truly inspirational, innovative, and impactful. Um, <clears throat> they're coordinating the work of many top researchers around the globe in the war on COVID and really exemplify how synergy can be achieved through inspirational collaboration. First, I'm gonna tell you a bit about Jacqueline Fabius. I don't know if it's Fabius or Fabius. That is correct. Okay, good. Um, she's currently the Chief Operating Officer of the Quantitative Biology Institute at uh, UCSF. She's been doing that tw since 2016. Before that, she was an independent consultant uh, for diverse operations so many times, in all cases having to do with humanity, uh, including be the, being the UN officer for uh, project services in Haiti for three years. And uh, she was educated at Hamilton College with a year at the Sorbonne in Paris. And um, she speaks five languages, including French, Italian, and Hebrew. Um, and she, you know, she's been publishing papers recently. For example, she and Nevin have something fascinating coming up in Cell uh, titled um, Creating Collaboration by Breaking Down Scientific Barriers. And I think, you know, this will be a great example of what can be done through synergy. And she was recognized at UCSF with the Chancellor Award uh, for diversity in 2019. So Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us. And um, Nevin um, has really become a science superstar. And I think you're still less than 50 years old. Um, yeah, I'm 45. <laughs> I just look absolutely older. Absolutely incredible. Um, so at the University of Regina in Canada, he hails from Canada. He got his BS in chemistry uh, and master's in biochem, and at the University of Toronto, got a PhD in me medical genetics only in 2005. So most of his accomplishments in research have simply exploded since then. Um, he manages an annual budget in research of $33 million, including something like um, $5 million directly to support his lab. And he's currently, um, uh, either um, the principal investigator, project leader, center director, or co-investigator on 17 um, research grants. Um, he, uh, he works in areas HIV, uh, SARS-CoV-2, Ebola virus, neurobiology, um, cell map initiative in systems biology. And I've come to know Nevin through you know, his groundbreaking breaking work in HIV research, where he's really uh, led a huge team effort that has systematically mapped the interactions of all HIV proteins with the human proteome, something that's led to just incredible insight and really built th that machinery. Having that in place allowed his group, uh, spearheaded by uh, graduate student David Gordon, to publish a paper on the interaction of all SARS coronavirus uh, proteins with the human proteome just months after the pandemic had started and the sequences were available. Um, and uh, uh, um, he's published 300 papers uh, with just an amazing stream of continuing, um, you know, real breakthrough papers. And uh, I probably haven't um, told you enough, but if I were to tell you uh, about all of his awards affiliations, I mean, even, even listing all of his uh, faculty positions, he's currently professor of microbiology at uh, Mount Sinai, uh, senior investigator at the Gladstone Institute. Um, it's just really hard to even manage all of this. Uh, I don't know if you sleep at all, Nevin, this is, <laughs> Incredible. And of course, I see the Canadian flag behind you. Um, but he's also a professor at the uh, UCSF 
um, Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology Department. Among his most distinguished awards, and you know, there are so many, um, you know, he was a Keck Distinguished Young St Scholar, he was a Searle Scholar, um, and you know, just this year was recognized as being in the top 1% uh, of citations for uh, his field in the year, but I'm sure it's very high in science overall, probably top 1% in science overall. Um, he's also won the Blavatnik Awards, the Roddenberry Prize, um, and you know, much more is to come, I know. But um, the uh, breadth of your work is astounding. Thank you so much for taking the time out to uh, speak with us today, to join us today. All right, thank you, um, Eddie, for that generous intro, probably too generous, but I, I appreciate it nonetheless. Uh, so we're going to do a joint presentation. I think Jacqueline's gonna share her slides. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, something. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes this is good. All right, so um, again, thanks, Eddie, for the invitation. We're, we're delighted to be here. What we're going to do is, um, as I said, do a joint presentation between myself and Jacqueline, and we're going to tell you about our COVID-19 um, research, but we're also going to put it in the context of uh, the Quantitative Biosciences Institute, which, as Eddie said, has been around now for um, almost um, uh, five years. And one of the motivations behind the Institute, and I would say probably our research in general, is the development of different technologies and more importantly, putting them together in a disease agnostic way and, and focusing um, the integrated set of tools on a number of different disease areas. So the, the technology that we're talking about, Eddie kind of uh, referred to some of it, mass spectrometry, uh, genetics, a lot of CRISPR-based genetics now, chemistry, chemical biology approaches, and structural biology approaches as well. And you're gonna hear about all of these um, today. And we put these together in a pipeline. I like to think of it as a pipeline and we focused it on a variety of different disease areas in the context of these different cell mapping initiatives, including the cancer cell map initiative. This was started in collaboration with Trey Idaker in San Diego, the psychiatric cell map initiative. So a, a lot of work ongoing right now on different psychiatric disorders and neurodegenerative diseases as well. And then the host pathogen mapping initiative where we're using these tools uh, on a variety of different um, pathogens. And really one of the foundation uh, data sets for all of these initiatives is mass spectrometry based protein protein interaction analysis. So for example, um, we've been generating host pathogen protein protein interaction maps using an affinity tag purification mass spectrometry based approach, initially focused on, as Eddie said, HIV, but we've over the last um, several years focused on different viruses like West Nile virus, hepatitis B and C, um, different flaviviruses like dengue and Zika, different bacterial species as well, looking at the secretome. And normally one of these maps done well uh, takes at least a couple of years. Well, the effort that we put into generating the SARS-CoV-2 human protein protein interaction map uh, took a couple of weeks. And to me, that's a testament to the collaborative spirit that went into this effort. And this is gonna be a theme throughout the presentation here today. Um, is collaboration. And so we also thought we would take uh, some time to give a bit of a background on QBI and also explain why we were so well situated for the formation of a group like the QCRG, the QBI Coronavirus Research Group, so quickly. So QBI is comprised of 103 affiliated labs, which are focused on collaborative research, uh, agnostic technology, it's disease agnostic, discovery science, and ex experimental and computational. As Nevin mentioned, we're known for our cell mapping initiatives, uh, and we will really be taking a deep dive into HPMI, the host pathogen map initiative today, as we talk to you. Uh, we're recognized for our focus on young scientists and the empowerment of women. And however, we are most known for our multiple events, uh, both local and international, and all of this helps us form a culture, a culture of collaboration. And our events uh, are a bit out of the box uh, and it's a way to reach out to the broader community. So for example, 
when we've had certain symposia, we've had uh, panels such as uh, the Lyme disease panel around an arthropod borne disease symposium, which uh, and the panel had an expert from NIH, someone from industry, a PI, and to our surprise, over 100 people attended, even though they were also at the symposium. Uh, with that, we also teamed up with USAID and had a photo exhibit on Zika, uh, and also very successful. At the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative Symposium, we teamed up with a foundation, and we were able to have art that was made by people living with autism. Uh, just to change the conversation around the symposia sometimes. We've also teamed up with a woman-owned business, Post Hoc, that specializes in salons, and we've had salons around specific research topics, cancer, psychiatric um, uh, uh, diseases and disorders, as well as uh, host pathogen um, initiative topics such as CRISPR. These have been very successful because they gather uh, people who are both influential and potentially affluent uh, and who could be donors, but who are really conversation starters within their communities. We've also done things such as focusing our social media on representing scientists as normal people. As you know, as scientists yourselves, scientists are often represented in a very specific way in movies or media in general. And so we really focused on what inspires the scientists, why you're doing this, why your research is important and so on. And this has had a good following as well. Again, out of the box, uh, we just keep trying different things to reach out to people. We, uh, we tried a cooking show, again, teaming up with Post Hoc, where the scientists would learn how to cook, and then there would be a conversation, an interview, so to speak, on their specific expertise. Among our young, uh, the focus on the young, we have a QBI fellowship uh, where we identify uh, young, promising standout candidates and speed up their, uh, their career from graduate student and the, the PI where they get a two-year fellowship at QBI with an office space and a small lab for funding. This is Clement Verba, and he'll be playing a role in the story that Nevin's going to be telling you later on. On our focus on the empowerment of women, we also started the QBI Scholarship for Women in Developing Nations. And this, of course, is twofold. First, the woman can come um, and really uh, empower her knowledge of science to various collaborations and exposure that she can have at UCSF. But then when she goes back to her country, she becomes the point of contact for collaboration. So for example, this scholar from Uganda is right now a co-author on a piece that we're writing on COVID in Africa. We also, to foster the collaborative spirit, started things at home, such as the QBI happy hour. And these were uh, sort of unique in that each month, three labs were selected of the 103, and they would nominate a postdoc who would have five minutes to present a maximum of three slides while beverages and hot snacks were served. And this was incredibly uh, successful. It, in, you know, at one point, an enthusiastic young scientist approached me and said, oh my god, this is like Cupid for scientists. OK, Cupid for scientists. Um, so our culture of collaboration, as Nevin mentioned, starts at home with the cell mapping initiatives, each of which is comprised of 10 to 15 um, labs that are focused and who bring their own expertise to one question. Uh, and we started thinking, well, if we're mapping the cells in, in, these, in this way, what if, what if in the same way we map the cells, we started mapping the world with collaborative interactions? What if cell mapping equaled world mapping and protein-protein interaction equal people-people interaction? We started to look at where we were going around the world <clears throat> to meet different people, scientists, foundations, institutions. And we started looking at it in this network kind of way to understand what was happening. And we quickly noticed that in fact, different scientists and places were focused around certain topics such as cancer, technology, neurodegenerative diseases and so on. And you'll notice that in our network, interestingly, both New York and Paris were already identified. They will play an important role in the story that we're telling you. At this time at QBI, we have a number of formal uh, international uh, collaborations with in Germany, Ireland, France, Nigeria, Poland, Israel, the UK, and importantly, the Institut Pasteur, uh, which Nevin will be going into a little bit more. So the formation of the QCRG, the QBI Coronavirus Research Group, was really the understanding of the context of a coming pandemic and taking action. So initially we had 22 labs at UCSF that came together to address COVID-19, which quickly grew to 42 labs at UCSF and others beyond. 
This, of course, became unsustainable on Zoom as hundreds of scientists were tuning in to talk. And so they were quickly broken into subgroups, which Nevin's going to tell you about. And these groups were broken uh, into different biological processes that the virus comes in and hijacks and rewires, such as translation and ubiquitination led by David Ruggiero and John Gross, respectively. And then also broken into different technological areas, uh, including structural biology. And that's being led by Clem Verba, the QBI fellow that Jacqueline told you about, and um, Oren Rosenberg. I'm going to come back to their efforts in just a few minutes. So um, here are three uh, publications that have come out from uh, QCRG uh, over the last several months. The first one on the left uh, um, published at the end of April. This is our protein-protein interaction analysis that Eddie talked about at the beginning. And the goal was to identify human proteins that then we could overlay with existing drugs and through drug repurposing, potentially find drugs that could have some antiviral effects against SARS-CoV-2 and um, COVID-19. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, at the top there, at the end of June, we had an, uh, another publication. I'm not gonna go into detail into this paper uh, during this presentation, but just to tell you, this was another host-directed analysis in infection. We were um, looking at the changes in phosphorylation in the context of infection with the ultimate goal of identifying the kinases that were being misregulated to identify kinase inhibitors. A number of those are actually in clinical trials um, right now. And um, then on uh, the bottom, this is where we've done a comparative host coronaviral protein protein interaction and uh, analysis. I will be talking about that later, but first a few words on the um, nature paper, the SARS-CoV-2 protein protein interaction analysis. Um, this really uh, launched uh, uh, the QCRG and uh, a number of clinical trials have been started based on this work as well. So the QCRG was the first to clone out all the genes, which we then put through an APMS pipeline and generated the SARS-CoV-2 protein-protein interaction map. We sent these genes and or plasmids around the world and we distributed them very quickly, really cutting through any kind of red tape uh, first by announcing on Twitter that we had them available and ready to ship to anyone who needed them. Now, just to say we didn't have a request any MTAs, no lawyers involved, which I think was a very good thing. And that's how we could easily distribute those plasmids around the world and help expedite research on SARS-CoV-2. So here is a, a look at the um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, human protein protein interaction map that we had generated using our affinity tag purification mass spec a base pipeline. I was in class. Um, that we've used on a, a number of different um, pathogens in the past. We identified uh, over 300 human run. proteins that were connected to at least Why? one SARS CoV 2 protein. And um, efforts from Brian Shoykat and Kayvon Shoykat. <laughs> I know, no one else is doing this. They were trying. Hello, uh, whoever's not speaking, please mute your mute your microphone. So here's the, uh, a, a map of over 300 human proteins that we identified. And uh, Kayvon Shokat and Brian Shokat, two great chemical biologists here at QBI and at uh, UCSF, then identified um, 69 different drugs or uh, compounds that they thought would target and inhibit at least one of the human proteins that we think the virus would need to infect our cells. And then the goal was to try to see if these drugs and compounds did have any antiviral effects. And at the time we didn't have the virus propagating here in, in a BSL-3 in any lab in, in the Bay Area. Melanie Ott more recently has now has, has had set up at the Gladstone Institute and we're starting to work with her. But at the time we reached out to our extensive network that Jacqueline talked to you about uh, and started to collaborate with the Pasteur Institute, in particular, Marco Vignuzzi and Olivier Schwartz and Christophe Danfer and Veronica. Uh, and then also a, a great friend and a great bio virologist, Adolfo Garcia Sastra at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and in particular, Chris White in, in his <coughs> laboratory. So these were great collaborators that um, were brought to bear here in this pandemic. So an interesting backstory is that uh, of course, at the rise of the pandemic, it was not difficult to send the drugs and compounds to New York, but it was incredibly difficult to send them to France because we were suddenly facing all kinds of travel bans, which had an effect on shipment as well. We had developed a relationship with the French consulate of San Francisco in 2019 when we'd had our first joint symposium with the Pasteur. And at the rise of the pandemic, they called us to ask if there was anything they could do to help. And in fact, there was. 
And so as a result, the French consul at, in San Francisco called the French ambassador in DC, who himself called the head of FedEx in the United States and the head of uh, French customs in Paris to enable our drugs and compounds to flow through seamlessly without being stopped on the way. So as the science was advancing as a, at a breakneck speed, we found it very important uh, on a, in our communications team to start really building our narrative and engaging people and keeping the public, donors, staff, government agencies, people in biotech and generally the media informed of what was happening with the QCRG and what research was happening. And we tried our best to put it in lay terms. At the first paper, there was a sudden media explosion, which uh, we weren't quite used to, a tremendous amount of coverage of um, the, the first couple of papers. And as I'm sure you know, as scientists, when the media or the press picks up your particular research, it's not always true that what you have found to be important or the key aspect of your research that is highlighted in the story. And so as such, we found it important to also write our own story and put them out there in our own voice to emphasize also what was important in our vision. And we did so through blogs, through the conversation, which is very accessible to people in academia and by writing editorial pieces and making sure that there were, there were pieces out there that were spoken in a real voice that speaks to a lay audience in a way that you would mention things to family and friends. At the same time, we pivoted uh, QBI TV, which existed, but which was on a very low flame to suddenly be very important in the coronavirus times. And for example, we had an anthropology major uh, who interned with us over the summer and who's interested in the effect of the coronavirus on scientists at this time. And she headed a number of shows in a uh, series called Science in the Times of Corona. And these covered a number of different topics. Uh, for example, the French consul interviewed the head of the Pasteur Institute, as well as Nevin on the collaboration, but there were also topics about the effects of the coronavirus on students and postdocs and how that was for them, as well as what was happening with specifically women in science uh, during this time. Uh, we also decided to be a bit creative and created uh, something that's an offshoot of the well-known show 60 Minutes, and we created 60 Seconds, a QCRG Minute, where we really highlight the trainees who are behind the scenes doing a lot of the work and here I'm going to share with you a one minute snippet uh, of uh, Sarah Rockwood from the cardiovascular subgroup. Is this virus able to actually get inside of the heart and affect the cell types within the heart directly? We found that cardiomyocytes, which are the main cell type in the heart that drives contraction and gives it most of the function and ability to pump blood, to our surprise, were very susceptible. They harbored very large amounts of virus after being infected with a very low initial amount of virus. So it was um, clear that they were also probably not only being infected, but replicating and creating even more virus and spreading that infection pretty quickly um, within, our, within our cultures. So since then, we've been doing a lot of work to compare what we're finding and what we're discovering in, in vitro in these cell-based systems and potential ways to actually block that from occurring and the different mechanisms of viral entry and we're also looking in patient samples um, to understand if there's a correlation if there, if we're actually capturing what might be happening in the live human heart. So what we found as a result of all this communication is that there was an army of willingness that, um, that started emerging. And these were people who were extremely uh, influential within the, the community and who were just coming out on their own to support us on Twitter or in various other ways. And so for example, uh, the co-founder of Twitter, Biz Stone, uh, among other things, introduced us to a company called Zoic Labs, which, uh, which is actually a Hollywood-based company uh, working on films such as uh, The Life of Pi. And they were interested in helping us visualize the map that was created. Uh, I would encourage you to visit this map. If you can, you can contact us and uh, we'll tell you how. All right, so now back to the protein-protein interaction map. And as I said before, through great work from Brian Shoykat and um, Kayvon Shoykat, we identified 69 different drugs or compounds that we would think would target at least one of the human proteins that hopefully would be enriched for being needed for the virus to infect our cells. And um, we were testing these 69 different drugs and compounds with collaborators in New York and Paris. We found many of them had antiviral effects. Uh, and in fact, 26 of these are being tested right now in clinical trials for COVID-19. 
some of which were more involved in than others. Uh, but I wanted to tell you about two uh, drugs that we're particularly excited about. These are two translational inhibitors. The first one is uh, zotadafin. Uh, this is a drug which targets a translational initiation protein that was on our map. And um, it is presently being used to treat multiple myeloma. It was made from the company Effector. Kayvon Shokat was one of the co-founders. We got FDA approval just recently for a, um, a clinical trial and DARPA is actually now funding this clinical trial. So we're very excited about this particular drug. Um, but the other one I wanna go into more detail with is a drug called um, Apladin. Uh, it, it is also um, being used to treat um, multiple myeloma. Uh, it's from the pharma, uh, company um, Pharmamar uh, and it targets uh, another translational protein called EIF1A. Uh, which is a connection from our map as well. Uh, and interestingly, it comes from this sea creature that exists exclusively off the coast of Spain. It's a sea squirt. Uh, and there's the structure of apladin, and there it is binding to um, uh, EIF1A. Uh, uh, it's not a structure not from us, but it's been um, characterized. And in collaboration with Adolfo Garcia Sasher, we were looking at to see how potent it was in a laboratory setting. So we looked in HEC-293 cells expressing ACE2, uh, and you can see that it actually has an IC90 that's sub-nanomolar. So we've been screened thousands of drugs in collaboration with um, scientists in New York and Paris and elsewhere. This is by far the most potent one we've seen, at least in the laboratory setting. It's 30 times more potent than around Desivir in these human cells. There's primary lung cells as well. You can see it's very potent as well at a, at a much lower concentration than uh, you see for uh, remdesivir. And we also had a mouse model that we used where you can take an adenovirus and you can um, get the mice to express human ACE2 and get them infected with SARS-CoV-2. And then we're adding the drug to the mice and then extracting the lungs from the mice and then looking at the viral lung titer. So you can see on the right there with apladin, you see about a two and a half log decrease of um, infection uh, using a concentration that's much lower than um, remdesivir. And as this work was ongoing, we were collaborating with the company Pharmamar, as I said, that's used this drug to treat multiple myeloma. And they've uh, completed a phase two clinical trial for uh, COVID-19. We've looked at the data, it looks incredibly promising. And um, a phase three clinical trial is about to begin in Spain. And they're actually negotiating with, um, I think, 65 other sites around the world uh, for phase three clinical trial data. So we're very excited about this particular drug. And uh, we're hoping that you'll be hearing about it soon as another option uh, for treatment of COVID-19. So as we've been hearing about, there's been a lot of talk about these different uh, variants and we're starting to focus um, on these ones that are seemingly more transmissible. And one of the, the great advantages is if you target a human protein with the drug, like we've been doing, it doesn't matter how much the virus will mutate. So if you have a drug that kills SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't matter how much SARS-CoV-2 is going to be it. You're always going to be able to get it. And then the logic is hopefully it'll be applicable for SARS-CoV-3 in the future. So we've been doing a lot of work here uh, just recently with the UK variant in collaboration with Greg Towers at University College London. He's one of the few labs that actually has the full length virus growing in, in a laboratory setting. And we found that apladin, or it's pladepsin as it's called when it's used to treat um, COVID-19, uh, has a similar potency when you look at the UK variant uh, when compared to the older lineage. And it's not a surprise because you're, you're targeting a human protein. You're not actually targeting the virus. So we have a lot of work on going now with these different variants, studying these mutations from all three of these variants. And I'll be discussing that um, a little bit later on in the talk. So I wanna shift gears now and tell you about some of, of the more recent work. And this is um, the a science paper uh, that came out a couple months ago. This is this comparative host coronavirus protein interaction network reveals pan viral disease mechanisms with the ultimate goal of trying to identify pan viral therapeutic strategies. And I really like this paper because it tries, it integrates a lot of the work that's been going on with respect to, to, to QCRG. We're combining a lot of different technologies together in a very collaborative way. You can see there's 200 authors on this paper from 14 different institutions from six different countries. So I'm particularly proud of this particular paper because of the collaborative spirit that went into it. And here's an overview of this study. 
So at the top there, just like we've done for SARS-CoV-2, we cloned out each one of the SARS-CoV-1 and, and MERS uh, proteins uh, and put affinity tags on them, purified them from human cells, uh, carried out mass spectrometry analysis to identify the protein-protein interaction analysis. And in parallel, we we're also individually expressing each one of these proteins and carrying out microscopy to see in which um, subcellular compartment uh, these proteins were localizing to. And for about half of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, we actually generated endogenous antibodies so we could look at in um, infected cells as well. All right, so the goal here at the bottom here is to do a comparative network analysis across these three different viruses. We uh, did uh, genetic RNAi and CRISPR-based genetic analyses. Uh, and we focused on key nodes for structural analysis, as I'll tell you about. And we also tried to connect all of this data to, to real world clinical data um, as well. So here's a look at our SARS-CoV-1 human protein protein um, interaction map. We also generated a, a MERS human protein protein interaction map. And here's a look at, or just a version of that map. And there's a number of different ways one can compare these three different maps. Personally, I just think hierarchical clustering is a very powerful way to compare these uh, interaction data sets. And here's just a cluster gram of these three data sets. And um, what you can see here is that in cluster two, about a fifth of all interactions are shared between all three viruses. And cluster four, about a quarter, uh, you see with SARS-1 and SARS-2 and not MERS. And then in cluster five, about a fifth of them, you see them uh, but if, uh, are MERS-specific protein-protein interactions. So here is a way in which we try to integrate together all three of these maps into one network through a process called differential network mapping. There's the map on the top left-hand corner. This is done in collaboration with Triadica. We actually built this pipeline to look at networks across different cancer cells. And we just took it in and uh, focused it here. It was very applicable to this looking at different viruses. And on this network, what I'm showing you there on the bottom left, we're looking at these three different clusters. So where there's interactions with all three, SARS-1, SARS-2 specific interactions and MERS specific interactions. And when we look at the different um, colors of the edges, that's what corresponds to these three different sets of interactions. So if the edges are black, we find that interactions with all three viruses. If they're blue, they're MERS specific. And if they're red, they're more specific to SARS-1 and SARS-2. And here's just a zoom up of, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, of some of the uh, interactions that I want to highlight. So at the top there, we have NSP6 only with SARS-1 and SARS-2 interacting with SIGMAR1. This is a factor that we've been excited about for some time and we've genetically validated uh, this as I'll show you in uh, just a few slides. In the middle there, we have a number of black edges with the N protein. Uh, and that means these interactions exist for all three viruses, including many involved in RNA processing. And then we have case in kinase two as well. This is a um, kinase that we find to be misregulated in our global phosphorylation studies. And there's a drug there um, that's in uh, phase one clinical trial right now for COVID. Um, that targets case and kinase 2. And the, the, high, the theory would be that this would also work for obviously SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and SARS-CoV-3 when we ultimately encounter it. And then on the bottom right, I just want to highlight some blue edges here. These are MERS-specific connections between NSP14 and a number of proteins involved in DNA damage response and cell cycle arrest, including MRX involved in DNA repair, MR11, RAD50, and then you see P53 here as well, which I think is incredibly interesting. This is a very tight interaction between P53 and NSP14. So the question is, you know, why are these DNA repair, DNA damage factors connected to NSP14 only with MERS? We don't know. We're looking more in detail on this. But overall, I would say these maps have generated a lot of hypotheses that we and others around the world are now following up on. So as I said, in parallel, we're also doing um, localization studies with the individually expressed proteins. And this is done in collaboration with Robert Gross in Freiburg and Andrew Pett in, in Sheffield. Svenja has done a, a great work here in the, uh, the Gross lab. And all this is, everything we do is in great collaboration with Adolfo Garcia Sastra. So we individually transfected in these proteins one at a time from all three viruses. And then as I alluded to, uh, for 14 of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, we actually have antibodies against the endogenous proteins so that we could actually look in infected cells as well. So we used all of these reagents to generate a lot of images, which um, are obviously now available to the scientific community. And what we tried to do is look at these images and <coughs> try to consolidate them into 
uh, some digestible format, which is represented now on the next slide. So here's a summary of the localization from the transient transfections from the three different uh, viruses. So uh, we've broken them down into these um, uh, different subcellular compartments. So the blue, the more blue it is, the more we think that it's localized too. And we've also overlaid on top of this, uh, the localization data from the antibodies targeting the endogenous uh, proteins. Obviously that's just for SARS-CoV-2. So there's some overlap there and there's some differences. I just wanna highlight one particular protein, ORF9B, that only exists in SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 and not MERS. And you can see that's at the bottom, it's a third from the bottom. It's localizing to the mitochondria. It's the only SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2 protein localizing to the mitochondria. That's the blue box. And then you can see the overlapping um, red box there, which means we have a strong uh, staining in infected cells. We also see it localizing there as well. And this is the image of ORF9B localization in infected cells. And you can see this is a quintessential um, localization to the mitochondria. I'm gonna come back to this connection of ORF9B with the mitochondria in just a few minutes. I just want you to remember it though. So as I said, in parallel, we're also carrying out genetic analyses, uh, a variety of different ways with our collaborators around the world and including with Veronica and Marco at the Pasteur Institute. So here, we used A549 cells expressing ACE2 and RNAi to knock down each one of the 332 SARS-CoV-2 interacting proteins one at a time. And we used RTQPCR as our readout to see what effects the genetic perturbations had on infection. And in parallel, we're also working with the company Syntego, which is from South San Francisco. They generously knocked out each one of these genes one at a time in CACO2 cells using CRISPR. And then these cells were sent to Chris Bassler at Georgia State University in Atlanta, where uh, he did a, a different assay. He was basically infecting these knockout cells and then taking the virus off these cells and then reinfecting other cells and using a, a, a different assay to look for infectivity using an antibody against N. So here we're looking at uh, two different genetic perturbation strategies in two different cells, two different assays in two different continents, which led us to uh, conclude that at least in one of these assays, 73 out of the 332 genes, when knocked out or knocked down, had a statistically significant impact on SARS-CoV-2 infection. So in red there, these are genes when knocked down in A549 cells that have an effect. In yellow, that's from the CACO2 cells. And in orange, this is where we see an overlap of the uh, two cells. And just to highlight SIGMAR1, which is again, a gene we're particularly interested in because we can uh, seemingly pharmacologically inhibit this and have an effect on antiviral um, or have an antiviral effect. Um, so again, there's similarities, there's differences, but overall we've identified 73 different genes from this initial set that at least in one cell type has seemingly has an effect. And here's a summary of that data where the blue nodes corresponds to the 73 different genes. And then what we've done is overlaid here um, the protein-protein interaction data from the three different viruses. So if the um, diamond, red diamond is SARS-CoV-2, orange diamond is SARS-CoV-1, and then yellow, uh, it corresponds to MERS proteins. And I wanna zoom up on one particular set of connections here. This is again now going back to ORF9B. So both in SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 ORF9B, we find it physically associated with TOM70. And TOM70 is a mitochondrial uh, chaperone. And that's consistent with ORF9B being localized um, to the mitochondria. And now back to the QCRG subgroups, specifically the QCRG structural biology subgroup or consortium. This is led by these two uh, fantastic young scientists, Oren Rosenberg and Klim Verba. Uh, they've put together um, 60 different researchers, mostly trainees, mostly uh, students and postdocs from 18 different labs. And they've been marching through, trying to structurally characterize not just the individual SARS-CoV-2 proteins, but the protein-protein interactions as well. So they were able to get a three angstrom structure here of um, TOM70 binding to ORF9B, uh, which is in orange here. And you can see that ORF9B here is tucking itself up into, which, which is the, the active site of TOM70. And the question is, what is TOM70? Well, as I said, it's, it's a chaperone for the mitochondria. It's involved in moving proteins in and out of the mitochondria. And the question is, well, what is ORF9B doing interacting with it? Well, maybe it's using TOM70 to get itself in the mitochondria and or maybe it's manipulating TOM70 in a way to alter chaperone of host proteins in a way that's beneficial for the virus. And we're looking more into detail on that now. 
There's some structural information there on the top right. This interaction is mostly hydrophobic with 36 out of the 38 ORF9B residues interacting with TOM70. And some other interesting information from our global phosphorylation studies, we actually find that S50 and S53 residues of ORF9B are phosphorylated. And that's where you can get this tucked up into the active site, into this cage of um, TOM70. And the theory would be that if these two sites were phosphorylated, um, there's no way ORF9B could interact with TOM70. And sure enough, when we make mutants, we, do, we lose this particular interaction. This is data we haven't published yet. And we actually think we know what the kinase is. Uh, it's a mark kinase. It's an interaction that we had with um, um, ORF9B, and we're looking more into details into that. So just a few more words about um, ORF9B. Uh, we call it the uh, shapeshifter. And when it's by itself, it actually forms a dimer. And you can see these beta sheet uh, representations here on this particular dimer. However, when it's not in a dimer, when it's a monomer, when it's binding to TOM70, it actually has a very different conformation. You see this alpha helicy. And to me, this is incredibly fascinating. And this brings up kind of a larger question. Is this a kind of a phenomenon with SARS-CoV-2 proteins? Are they, do they have a number of different configurations? And that's how they can be interacting with a, a number of different uh, proteins and impact on a number of different pathways. Maybe this is more of a viral phenomenon uh, as well, just for viral proteins. Because if you look at SARS-CoV-2, there's 30 genes or proteins compared to 20,000 in our cell. So I think this must be a way in which the virus can have a bigger impact. So we're looking more into that in general. And I just love this example too, because it's a combination of proteomics, cell biology, the, mic mic the microscopy, CRISPR-based genetics, biochemistry, and structural biology to narrow in on a key node, which we think is important for SARS-CoV-2 infection and SARS-CoV-1, and almost certainly SARS-CoV-3. And last thing I'll say here is that Brian Shoykat here is now looking at this structure, and he's made some predictions about compounds that may not interrupt this interaction, but hopefully could um, impinge on the function of this hijack complex. And uh, we're testing those now to see if they have any therapeutic value. And just a few more words about some of our structural analysis that's ongoing here in the QCRG. This is one really interesting example that's being led by Clem Verba. So this is a, a cryo-M structure of NSP2. So the NSP2 is conserved across all coronaviruses, but its function really is not known. We don't know what it does. And the QCRG subgroup, uh, structural biology subgroup, was able to get a three-ring structure of the N-terminal 70% of the protein. But that's the light blue, but in the dark blue, it was blurry. He couldn't, they couldn't get a high resolution um, uh, structure of that, the end of that protein. Um, however, as I think most people are familiar with now on, on this call, there's been some break, breakthroughs, breakthroughs on AI and AlphaFold and DeepMind and Google, and they've been able to accurately predict the structure of uh, proteins in a very exciting way. And uh, what they did was by serendipity, they actually took five different proteins um, and tried to solve the structure and then just put it online, put it on their website. And ironically, one of them was NSP2. So if you actually look at NSP2 structure, they got the domains right, but the overall configuration was all wrong. It was all jumbled up. But what Clem did was he took the cryo-EM and then he took the AI and he put it together and then he could now get a final structure of NSP2. And I think this represents the future or at least part of the future of structural biology where cryo-EM or maybe tomography can get you part of the way there then AI can come in and ultimately clean it up. Now work is ongoing to, to characterize structurally NSP2 with respect to its protein-protein interactions. I told you nobody knows what NSP2 does. Um, we find uh, that it's connected to RAP1, um, uh, GDS1. Uh, this is a protein upstream of a number of GTPases in the cell. And uh, we have a cryo structure of um, a RAP1, uh, GDS1, uh, binding to NSP2. NSP2 there is in blue and then, or sorry, it's in pink and um, RAP1 GDS1 is in um, blue. And then one of the ultimate goals here is to carry out structure-based um, drug design um, with these structures. And the last thing I just wanted to say too, we're now looking at the structure of NSP2 and trying to look at variants to see, okay, which ones map on the surface that exist in the wild and to see if they interrupt any protein-protein interactions. And there's one that we're particularly excited about. It's a T85I mutation uh, or a variant that's in about 20% of the viruses that are out there. Uh, and we're looking to see what effects it has on the protein-protein interaction landscape. 
Uh, and we also see actually in, a, in the laboratory setting, it actually has a phenotype. So I think what I'm presenting here is an infrastructure, you know, biochemistry, structure, proteomics, virology, for us to interpret all these variants and these different proteins that are coming online. So we're building up this capability and focusing in all the variants that are coming from all these different viruses. Uh, and just a few more words about our efforts here to look at these different uh, variants. So the, the goal here is to study the individual mutations or variants, and we're doing this a variety of different ways. Looking to see what effects the different mutations have on our protein-protein interactions or our proteomic analysis, carrying out biochemistry as well, structural analysis, where relevant. Uh, we now have bat cells working, so we're expressing SARS-CoV-2, um, original SARS-CoV-2 proteins, and then different variants as well to look at uh, the viral bat interaction analysis. We're really excited about this. Um, also carrying out post-translational modification mapping as we introduce in each one of these variant proteins um, into cells. And then CRISPR-based analysis as well, targeted CRISPR and then doing global CRISPR pooled as well. And as we've done before, we're distributing, we're going to be distributing all these variants to the community. We're actually now, it looks like going to be working with NIH to make pseudoviruses to distribute these as well so that different scientists around the world can study what effects these um, variants have um, in infection in a laboratory setting. And the last thing we're gonna say, we're, we're not just looking at the individual mutated genes or variants um, from these viruses, we're looking at the full length viruses as well. Um, a great collaboration right now ongoing with University College London with Greg Towers and Claire Jolly. So we're looking at these viruses, carrying out phosphoproteomics, abundance proteomics, ubiquitination analysis. This is another arm we don't have time to talk about today. Um, a drug screening there on the left, infection, uh, in bat cells and doing our proteomic analysis to see what effects you have there. CRISPR-based genetics are ongoing, again, both targeted and global, as well as uh, transcriptome analysis. So we're, we're, we're focusing our pipeline now that we've described to you today on all these variants, these scary variants that are upcoming to see if we can get a better understanding of what effects they're having on the host, which would hopefully lead to more intelligent therapeutic strategies in the future. So Nevin just mentioned the current collaboration with the UK. However, uh, as, as you may have uh, guessed, we have a number of collaborations and partners both in academia and industry, uh, which is actually con uh, continually growing because people contact us to see if what they have matches up or can be uh, complementary to what we're finding and uh, that's how dialogues start. Uh, and so sort of to wrap up, you know, when the pandemic started, uh, we'd had We'd had, I think, about 20 symposia planned for the year. And, uh, you know, initially, maybe for a day or three, we thought, oh my God, everything's come to a complete stop. But as I mentioned, we had quickly pivoted online with a number of creative uh, uh, ideas. And we also took our joint symposia online quite quickly. Uh, our first uh, very successful symposium was the QCRG COVID-19 Research Symposium, uh, which had over 800 people attend. Uh, which, which greatly encouraged us to continue. And we have uh, had a number of very successful joint collaborative symposia with uh, partners in Israel, in France, and in Ireland. And we were also able to use the, the available online tools to create breakout rooms and such for the PIs to meet, to decide on different projects to start working on together. So this is still ongoing. Um, I'm happy to say the pandemic has not beaten us down, uh, nor should it anyway. And as Eddie mentioned at the beginning, Cell has approached Nevin and I to write a piece uh, for them on our collaboration. And this again comes back to what I initially um, said, and I think is um, a theme throughout our presentation. You know, I have problems with the scientific enterprise. Uh, I think a major problem here is really how siloed it is. And the system, I would argue, uh, really rewards often the individual and often discourages against collaboration. But I think as a scientific community, we could all agree that we can move incredibly fast when we work together, when we can break down these silos across different labs, across different institutions around the world and between pharmaceutical companies and uh, academic institutions. So the, the hope here is that when the dust settles on COVID-19, that we keep this infrastructure and this spirit alive so that we're better prepared for the next pandemic. And then the larger question is, why aren't we doing this all the time? Why aren't we working on all diseases like this? Why aren't we working on HIV and breast cancer and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? Uh, because uh, we can get to treatments, I would argue, so much 
um, uh, sooner. So this has obviously been a tragedy, but I think this has been a great silver lining of this pandemic. And I hope we learn our lesson, the scientific community. Uh, and I'm excited now, uh, much more excited about the future because of these lessons that we've learned. So um, obviously a lot of people are involved in this. I think we, we did acknowledge most of the people that we've been working with over the last year on COVID-19. Here's a picture of our lab that was taken, uh, I guess a few months before the shelter in place here in California. And just to highlight a few people here that have um, contributed to this work in the bottom left-hand corner is Dave Gordon. Uh, and on the top right-hand corner is a technician, um, Gwendolyn Jang. They really spearheaded our protein-protein interaction efforts. Um, I, guess, I guess starting about a year ago now. Um, and at the top there at the back is uh, Mehdi, uh, a postdoc. Um, he um, led our uh, phosphoproteomic analysis, which I didn't have time to go into. And then the three other faces there that are circled, uh, Danielle Sweeney, Ruth Hittenhain, and Robin Cake. These are three fantastic mass spectrometrists. They were crucial in all of our efforts here, not just with COVID-19, but um, all the work that we do. So I'd like to thank all of them and we'd like to thank all of you for attention and we'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Nevin for really just an outstanding exposition of how humanity and science can contribute to such an important problem and the inspiration to spread this to all of science. Um, at this point, um, uh, Marty, you have yeah. to Thank you. Uh, uh, from the listening audience, we just want to thank you for your terrific exposition and, of course, the phenomenal work. Uh, my question is about the variants, the new variants that have come up. Um, for example, uh, this, uh, this deletion in the spike protein, uh, amino acids 69 and 70, this has come up more than once. So it's, it seems unlikely that it's just random drift. Do you have any insights into what the particular selection is at, at, at the protein at the level? Is it is it all ACE2 or is it more than that? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. This is what we're trying to systematically address. So if you look at the UK variant, there's 23 mutations in it, 17 of which result in changes in protein. Uh, eight of those 17 fall into um, the spike protein. So there's, people are assuming that these mutations are the ones that are driving the differences in transmissibility. And I think that's a good that's a good theory. And we're looking at those eight in a number of different uh, in vitro assays here that have been developed in a couple of other projects that would the QCRD that we didn't have time to talk about with Ashish Manglik and, and, and Jim Wells. So we have these tools to look at um, in vitro uh, at ACE2 and spike interactions. Um, we're also making pseudoviruses with these to, to look at them in more detail. Um, but I'd also like to point out that there's another nine mutations in the UK variant, and um, there's three in NSP3, the protease. There's a small deletion in NSP6. There's a couple mutations in the N protein, and there's three mutations in ORF8. Uh, so I'm really interested to see um, what effects those mutations have um, on the protein-protein interaction landscape. So as I said, we've now taken our pipeline and we're focusing on all these different mutated proteins in a variety of different ways. And, uh, we're going to have a lot of information, Martin, I hope very, very soon to be reporting on on that front. Yeah, great. Do you have any evidence for convergent evolution of, uh, uh, you know, mutations in different sites? Yeah, we're looking at that in, in great detail uh, as well. Um, another thing I'd comment, I just briefly alluded to as well to kind of address that we have these bat cells growing now. It's these lung bat cells. Um, it's a cell line and they're transfectable. Uh, and we're going to be having uh, SARS-CoV-2 bat interaction maps and also viruses that are in bats that are not yet in human. So we're looking at those as well, to maybe to use these maps to be more predictive about what would be the next zoonotic event that would be happening in the future. And we're getting some advice from Harmeet Malik in Seattle on, on that front, who's an expert on uh, zoonosis. Thank you. Well, Nevin, uh, that's surprising that there's so many mutations because the uh, traditional outlook has been that there's quite good fidelity. So, you know, for coronaviruses, and we've been working on HIV for a long time, which is famous for variation. But um, what, at what stage are these, you know, mutations occurring? You know, it's a, it's a good point, too. I mean, if you look at and Adolfo was telling me the other day that the fidelity, the proofreading mechanisms 
in um, SARS-CoV-2 are six and a half times better than what you see in influenza. But, you know, so that's, that's good. But, you know, what we're seeing is this virus is just spreading so fast. And, you know, each infection is a new experiment for the virus, right? And, and so we're giving the virus a better chance to do what it wants to do, and that's mutate, right? So the fact that it spreads so quickly, this is why I think we're seeing it, you know, the, the mutational rate uh, go up. And um, why it's such a global health emergency. Yes. Uh, let's see, there are some other, um, there was a talk from Elizabeth Snyder. Uh, are there any efforts towards defining any cell type or spe tissue specific interactomes? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so we have, well, other than bats, we're, I mean, that's a different cell type, but uh, within humans, uh, works on going now to generate these maps in um, like four other cell types. I, I know cardiomyocytes is one for sure. Um, A549 cells, some macrophage cells, um, to see if we'll see if that's relevant. So there, there is ongoing work to look at these, these um, interactions um, in a variety of different cell types. And that'll be just as interesting, I think, as you go across different viruses, that's one axis, you can then go across different tissues to generate these maps um, in humans uh, from, from humans. So uh, I'm excited to see that data as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I should mention uh, a number of people are asking if this will be available in recorded form, and there are some answers. Darlene Bondock, who's really organized this whole thing, um, is uh, kindly uh, managing uh, recordings, and we're grateful to Jacqueline and Nevin for uh, agreeing to that. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, let's see. Um, so. Bill has a question, Bill Welsh, I believe. Do you know if ORF9b affects the electrochemical proton gradient in the micro mitochondria? Yeah, that's a great question. We're looking, we're, we're, we're throwing the kitchen sink at this ORF9b in terms of what effects it has on the mitochondria. And we're, we're looking at um, a variety of different mitochondrial readouts and we're actually doing a bunch of tomography too um, to see it kind of at a cellular level, what's happening with kind of the mitochondrial structure, if you will. So. Um, wait, uh, just wait. Great question. Uh, the data will be um, available about mitochondrial function very soon. I do have a question, thank you, about plitidepsin. Um, it's a complex, you know, uh, natural product. What are the prospects for uh, efficient large scale production of this amazing compound? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And they have it, PharmaMar has it now being used to treat multiple myeloma. So there's been um, uh, a way to synthesize this. Obviously, they're not just squishing these sea squirts to get this out. But, so there's a synthesis pipeline that's efficient enough to get it out to people with multiple myeloma. I mean, the question is, can it be scaled up if it is, if it does, this, if the phase three clinical trial does look as promising as we hope it does, um, I think they're in a good position to scale this up. One drawback here, one caveat, it has to be administered through IV. Oh, okay. I thought from the paper, it seems like it was oral. It's not, it's not oral, not yet. Although that is the same as remdesivir, right? Is, is an IV. So, so, um, but we are um, looking forward to seeing the phase three clinical trial data from this, and hopefully it can be at least somewhat useful in the current pandemic. That's a totally exciting and transformative development. I have a quick question on typical coronaviruses that cause the common colds, right? So up to 20% of common cold is caused by coronaviruses. Has any work been done to look at the uh, first SARS-CoV-2 and now these new variants versus just typical um, non-zoonotic coronaviruses? Yeah, there's a couple that we're looking at right now, OC43, and uh, the other is, um, uh, what is it, OC229. Uh, so yeah, the majority of coronaviruses are not as problematic as what we're seeing here with you know, SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-1. So um, we're looking at those. That's a great question as well. I didn't mention that, but we're, um, we've actually generated an OCP43 human interaction map, and we've done a lot of the stuff, the, the kind of the, the host-directed analysis that I talked about with SARS-CoV-2. So we're in the midst of analyzing that, and hopefully that could be fruitful to try to find, well, both similarities and differences going forward. Thank you. At this stage, I'm going to um, ask everyone to uh, 
you know, thank the speakers. I don't know how, but um, and and just again thank on behalf of the more than two hundred people who attended the seminar. Um, just you know, remarkable and as I said, in, in, inspirational. And Jackie uh, and or Jacqueline and uh, Nevin, we we have the separate Zoom meeting with the smaller group, including a, a number of students. So please join that. And thank you all Eddie, for I, attending. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Great seminar, Eddie. Thank you.